นโมตัสสะบะกะวะตุอะระหะตุสมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนโมตัสสะบะกะวะตุอะระหะตุสมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนโมตัสสะบะกะวะตุอะระหะตุสมมาสัมพุทธัสสะมุตังดามังสังกังนัมมาสัมมิคุณฟังได้ไหมครับฉันมีคอร์สของแมวอยู่ที่นี่ฮะฮะไม่ใช่ฉันไม่มีคุณมิครโฟนคาร์มาฮะคุณฟังได้ไหมครับฉันมีคอร์สของแมวอยู่ที่นี่ฮะฮะไม่ใช่ฉันมีคุณมิครโฟนคาร์มาฮะฮะไม่ใช่ฉันมีคุณมิครโฟนคาร์มาฮะ So ideally, the uh, purpose of religious practice is to uh, guide us to the ultimate truth, something like that, some kind of a, the the truth beyond our normal uh, worldly values, uh, the, whatever you call it, the, the meaning of everything, the ultimate reality, or something or other. But because it's so You know, so vague for most people. I guess a lot of the religions start off by giving a certain uh, belief system or a view or uh, even a dogma. Sometimes, you know, this is what you should do. This is what you should believe. And to uh, ideally give people a start anyway on the spiritual practice. But it'd be some. You know, a lot of people are a little bit. Uh, too gullible. I don't know. They just they don't think too much, so they just believe it. And sometimes even the Buddhist teachings has that because uh, it's a religion. You know, people tend to think, uh, what does what do Buddhists believe? Yeah, but what the Buddha really was talking about, you know, not to believe him. You know, take these teachings as a some as a, a point of reference or some reflections, contemplations. And find out for yourself. Investigate for yourself. You know the Buddha did talk about right view, but right view is the, there is some, some some particular details of it. But in general, it's just a belief or acknowledgement acknowledgement of the principle of cause and effect. Specifically, the the law of karma. You know, or skillful actions give pleasant results. Unskillful action give unpleasant results. At least it gives us the possibility when you can acknowledge that that you can do something, you can create good actions to have a positive result. Otherwise, you, you know, if you if, if you believe you're just stuck in this realm here and can't make any choices, can't make any any, any change, well, you don't even try. You don't even try to make any uh, effort in your spiritual practice. But the the right view is also the Buddha went one one further, I think. Because he said, in right view, you know, also uh, attaching to right view is not right view. Holding to it, just just uh, grasping it, even though it can provide, you know, it can provide a certain amount of comfort, maybe, or you know, give you a certain amount of of a. Uh, 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 you can feel you can feel you feel confident in it. Oh yes, the Buddha, you know. It, Believe, the Buddha was enlightened, and he had this belief system. If I just believe that, I'll be okay. But the Buddha is saying, even holding on to it is not right view, because it's just a, it's just a, another. It can be another form of attachment, another form of self. Yeah, we now we are we 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 are now identifying with us being a Buddhist who believes this. Rather than actually experiencing what the Buddha is talking about directly, and many times, as I mentioned before, that you know, many times the the ideals of spiritual practice of religion they tend to get compromised. I think partly because it is so vague. What do we hear? Are we here for you know? We just here for the the community. We're here for the sangha. We're here for the Dhamma teaching. 
you know, or are we here for the realization? Yeah. To be, you can say, to you know, follow the path of the Buddha and have a realization similar to the Buddha. Some people think it's too far away. I mean, the Buddha, is, you know, he's such, on such a high pedestal behind his, behind me there, so he's so high above us, we'll never get there. But rather than thinking so, you know, so idealistically, you just put one foot in front of the other and walk on the path, and we may arrive there. Well, if you keep walking on the path, you will arrive there eventually, but we just can't say when, you know, it could be, could be tomorrow, could be next lifetime, <laughs> no guarantee. Depends how, you say, how uh, confident and how steady your steps are on the path. <clears throat> and of course, because the, you know, like I say, the ultimate is for most people a bit so abstract or so far away that, uh, you know, it's, we have many challenges along the way, which is all of what, what spiritual practice is, facing the various challenges and the Fortunately for us, we the Buddhists outlined a very specific path of practice, so so we know we know we're in the right direction anyway. We know we're going in the right path, but the the path is different than you imagine. Yeah, for example, like the like I mentioned about morality last time, I think. Yeah, many people just think, oh, if I just practice these rules, then I will I will be safe. You know, the, the Buddha kept these, these particular kind of precepts. I mean, they're, most of them are, you know, recognized in society as being, you know, pretty reasonable and, and common uh, guidelines for skillful living, refraining from skills, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, you know, the lying. The one that gets a bit challenged in the West is drinking alcohol. Uh, it can be a challenge for some people. Uh, we grew up in a culture that that has alcohol a lot, you know, what's the point? What's the difference? What's the, what's the, what's the, why is it so bad? Yeah. But the, uh, most of them are pretty, pretty reasonable guidelines for skillful living, not only for spiritual practice, but even in the world. But the point is, if we kept, keep in mind the, the real point of spiritual practice is to realize the ultimate truth, yeah, which means, you know, it's, the, the biggest challenge, the biggest limitation to realizing the truth is the self, grasping a self. You know, we, uh, uh, we, we interact with reality filtered through our self. Uh, Buddha even referred to the body and the mind as the world. It's not a world out there, it's a world which is put together in our own body and mind. You know, the, the five physical senses interpret Get, get the in, data, receive the information, and it's the, the mind that puts it together. And depending upon our conditioning, our education, or you can say our, you know, our, our biases and prejudices and our upbringing, uh, we interpret it accordingly. So, you know, so we're trying to realize the ultimate truth, you know, through ourself. Well, that's the big, the big challenge, the biggest challenge. So we just interpret reality through ourself, through our own limitations. So fortunately, the Buddhist path is aimed at realizing, you know, no permanent self, you know, selflessness. That's the ultimate goal. And the whole path of practice, we keep that in mind and we, we, we develop these exercises and practices accordingly, like keeping the precepts. You know, to follow these guidelines for skillful living requires a certain amount of self-sacrifice, giving up of our old habits and our old tendencies. And if we understand that, then, you know, just uh, we look at how we keep those guidelines, for example, and if we feel comfortable with them, then maybe we should challenge ourselves. And challenge yourself. You go into the, go get get outside of our comfort zone because it, the self is being you know, sheltered by our habits, by our comfort zone. You know, okay, yes, I I, I agree to refrain from killing people. Yes, uh, I draw the line at killing insects. You know, it's dangerous, and they're you know 
unhealthy and they cause diseases and yeah. but you know there's a then there's a challenge there you try and also refrain from killing insects you have to challenge yourself challenge your views challenge your own fears maybe yeah. then it, you get you get you, the self gets pushed into its it's beyond its comfort zone and then it starts to complain Aha, we know the limits now. We're seeing, exposing the self now. Yeah. If we just stay within our comfort zone, within our usual habits, I mean, the, the sense of self is a, has many different dimensions to it, many different levels and background. There is a, you know, a, a clinging to pleasant feeling and uh, comfortable, comfortable experiences. They're not going to challenge me. They want to face unpleasant emotions. But when you do, you, know, you realize maybe you can even you can you can step beyond them. Yeah, you can push beyond the limits. Yeah, on a certain in certain uh, a few occasions in the Pali Canon, there's a mention of not just no permanent self, anatta, but there's mention of a of a maha atman, a great self, the greater self. Yeah, as somebody who's developed the great self, you know. There's a, you know, people have heard of, of, of Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma means Gandhi, the great self. Mahatma, Mahatma. He was a, he was a great person, you see. <clears throat> because he had, if you know his, but about, but about his life, you know, he, he, uh, he fasted and he had, he had a lot of, you know, struggles with his own, own emotions and limitations. He challenged himself. And he can go beyond then his, the usual you know, compulsions of his personal self, if you like. So when somebody has developed, they say, when he has developed, you know, sila, samadhi, panya, you know, to a high degree, they're called a great self. That means, you know, not just, say, just not just keeping the five precepts, but refining it to a very, very refined level. You know, the, the, the average person can probably keep the five precepts, but, you know, we're, Keeping those precepts at a very, very refined level. I mean, the, you know, the monastic rules have 227. Is some of them are just refinements of the five precepts. Not only refraining from from killing human beings and animals, but even damaging plant life. Yeah. So it's a, it's a increasing refinement of 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 non harming. And sometimes it's you know it does require a bit of a challenge. Sometime when my this branch is sticking over my path this morning, you know. I had to push it aside to get past, to get, because it was wet, you know. Why don't I just break it off? Nope. It's one of the precepts we have. I can't. I have to call Bryce over to guppy it. <laughs> <laughs> or I might still have in my mind to get some string and pull it back off the path, yes, but <laughs> it's easier to call Bryce. <laughs> But trying to uh, keep it in perspective that the path of practice is to realize selflessness, then we approach, you know, the Eightfold Path, Sila Samadhi Panya, with that in mind. So, you know, rather than just recognize, okay, not just not just keeping these rules, but you know, to re to refine it, to 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 push outside our comfort zone, and maybe it re requires us to adjust those particular guidelines. You know, we have the formal definition of them, but then we have to refine them somewhat. And even though it can be uncomfortable, but that's the whole point, you know, to see what's, what's the nature of that discomfort. It's the self which is being discomforted. You know, when the self is comfortable, we're in our, in our comfort zone, then think, oh, I've made it. You know, it seems like a little mini Nibbana, you see? Nirvana, I'm just comfortable. You know, the Buddha said it was the ultimate happiness, didn't he? <laughs> so, sitting in my nice warm room, or lying in your nice warm bed in the morning, you know, think, aha, this is Nibbana. <laughs> then ring, 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 the bell rings, oh, I have to get up and go to the morning chanting. Oh, oops, no, I'm not in Nibbana anymore. <laughs> Cold and have to get out and you're a bit stiff. And <laughs> What's the point? Aha, challenging myself, right. When I understand that, aha, right. Now it's rather than just suffer with it, 
I can rejoice. I'm practicing on the path, renouncing myself, my comfort zone. Yeah. Result, result, uh, renouncing some of my, my, my self-indulgences. Yeah. So it doesn't give you a positive approach to it then. I didn't say, oh, I have to get up and go to that morning chanting again. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, selflessness, right. Yes, joy. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you think of it in the right way, you know. <laughs> it's not a, not a chore. It's something which, you know, can be joyful because and if, we, if we are able to step outside the limitations of self, you know, you recognize the lightness of it. You know, having to cater to the self all the time is a, is a really, you know, tedious, tedious, tedious effort. You know, every little creak, every little discomfort, having to listen to it and cater to it, and uh, it's just really exhausting. But you can just forget about it, you know, let it go, you know, then it's a great relief. There is, there is a, you know, the, just, just talking about the basic, Expressions of self, greed, aversion, delusion. So the way to counter greed is renunciation. Uh, surrender, sacrifice, giving up, letting go. And when greed arises, we have to step outside that. Yeah, that, that compulsion, that, that desire, that, that movement, and try to renounce it. <clears throat> Sometime, I mean, we, we have in, the, you know, in our monastic form, we have some practices, which are called the kind of, formerly the ascetic practices, which one can undertake, and the point is to help us to kind of, you know, relinquish some of the, you know, even the, you know, monastic life, you know, can be comfortable sometimes, you know. <laughs> so sometimes there is big practices we can undertake, you know. For example, you know, the, the one that we keep here all the time is, is to eat all the food in the bowl, put the food in the bowl, you see. Well, I know, you know, there were most of the, the majority of monks in Thailand actually eat out of, off plates, They're at a table or, they, or on the floor, they eat off plates. You know, they didn't want to mix up their different curries, you see. So putting all the food in one big one bowl is an ascetic practice. You know, my favorite curry, then I just spilt some, some, some sweet on it or something, yeah. And it was, and in, when I was what was it uh, in Thailand in the early years, you know, they uh, first of all they, when there was only a few monks there, I think, then they used to the practice of Wat Papong was that the monks, certain monks, come down the line, and just ladle the food into your bowl. You, you couldn't even see what you're what, what you're getting. You couldn't even see what's what's being ladled in your bowl. They, you know, usually the monks went on alms round. And there was, I don't know, 30 monks there. So they went in different places. They got a little bag of food or something. Come back to the kitchen. And then the people in the kitchen, they put all the food in one big pot. Doesn't matter what it is. Vegetables, curries, uh, uh, meat, fish, everything. Just one big pot and then stir it up. Then they come down the row of monks and just ladle it into your bowl. So if you haven't got time to sort of look at it and say, oh, uh, please take the meat out, you know. No, psh, psh. you either either take it or you say you put your hand on top of the bowl and say, no thanks, no choice. You either just ate what, what was given to you or didn't have anything. Yeah. And then at the very end of, the, end of the food distribution, the last monk came down with the chili paste, you know, right on top, splat on top of it. <laughs> That's the only time I put my hand out. <laughs> Definitely no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but if you weren't quick enough, on your hand maybe. <laughs> but nowadays, you know, you can go down the line and help yourself. <laughs> Not like the old days when the monks were tough. <laughs> I was just remembering, I remember that story and then I. Also, my mind went on a little bit further about the very, very early days in Nana Chat, what Nana Chat, the International Monastery. And before coming, coming to Thailand, I'd been a traveler. And one of my travels was riding a bicycle in India. And riding a bicycle requires lots of energy. 
So I, you know, have a meal and two hours later I'm hungry again. So I have to, you know, look for food again. And then I, I had to find out what kind of food because uh, you eat quite a bit of protein when you're cycling. See? So I went to the library in Bombay, I think it was, and researched, you know, nutrition and all this, you know. If they have protein and vitamin A, B, C, D, uh, never been the vitamin K in those days, but anyway. So I learned a bit about nutrition. Then I went to Wat Nana Chat, and it was, you know, it was in the early days, the villager, it was a very poor village, Northeast Thailand. The villagers were, were, you know, gave us the, the best food they had, but they were still poor. I remember one time sitting there, and they, all the food was passed out already, and I looked in my bowl, and <laughs> no protein, no vitamin A, no vitamin B, no vitamin C. <laughs> How do we survive? But we did. <laughs> we did survive. <laughs> it was, um, I realized it was really astonishing how, you know, how the body could adapt and adjust. It, it is very, very ad adaptable. You know, so sometimes if you now you get very caught up with, oh, I need to, you know, all the, it doesn't matter. You, you can eat anything, you know, I mean, as long as it's not over a long period of time. I mean, granted, many of us were, were a bit malnourished. The, the early pictures, the early, early photographs of the monks there were all very thin. <laughs> before, the, before the food got abundant. <laughs> but we survived, we survived. Yeah. So we, we, the, we, we are very adaptable. You know. Even though we think if our mind takes off, you know, we could get very, very worried about things. You know, not enough of this, not enough of that, but the body mind is actually very, very flexible. You know, and we, we, we think about, oh, I need so much sleep or something or other, and, you know, but, you know, you can get by, you know. Surprisingly how much, how little sleep you can get by on if you need to. Yeah. But, you know, outside our comfort zone, you know, it, it will expose the sense of self. You know, maybe it even brings up not only, you know, not only the so-called physical discomfort, but maybe some of your psychological anxieties also. You know, when when you're when you're when you're hungry, for example, maybe there's more, you know, more sense of insecurity come up, more sense of fear, maybe. You know, it can expose some of these, uh, you know, some of the psychological levels of the self which are hidden under you know, the the external comforts of our life. They're everything familiar and comfortable to us. Just going to a foreign country. You know, you know I was, when I first went traveling, you know, I'd never been out outside for 20, you know, 18, 19 years, never been outside of Canada. I went to the, went to the States a few times, but it's not much different anyway. But then traveling to Europe, you know, where they speak a foreign language, you know, they couldn't speak to the people, you know, and, uh, you know, fortunately, most people were, you know, they, they had some familiarity with foreigners anyway, since many different, different cultures lived together in a small area in Europe, so. I learned a few important words, you know, yeah, but where the, where the train station is and things like that, but, and you could always, you know, look around and you could always roughly tell what a restaurant was like. <laughs> Until I, got to, until I got to Greece, I think it was. And in Greece, I couldn't even read the signs anymore because they have all these Greek letters, you know. They have deltas and epsilons and all kinds of things. I couldn't read what a restaurant was, but, but still got fed. You just have to use your nose then, you see. <laughs> Smell where the food is. <laughs> But the whole point of spiritual practice is to you know, try to challenge the sense of self. You know, and a lot of these uh, are, are Buddhist practices, not only you know, the, the keeping the precepts, but meditation practices too. Yeah. And the, you know, the, uh, like I say, the, with the three expressions of self, greed, aversion, delusion, uh, the way to counter the greed is, is uh, renunciation, uh, Letting go, giving up, surrender. Uh, way to deal with aversion, 
you know, is, is opening. You know, aversion is the pushing away, is the closing in or closing down or pushing away. And uh, then the way to counter it then is to open up. You know, it's like what's the practice of friendliness? Friendliness is being friendly to, which normally we would reject. Not trying to be friendly to something, which we normally normally would not be. You know, we have our own particular. I don't like this. This is what defines me. I don't like that. I don't like that kind of person or something other, that kind of situation. You know, so, so when that person, that situation arises, we feel uncomfortable. So we try and reject it. But now to try and open to it, be friendly to it, receptive to it, you know, it can be very, you know, can really rattle your sense of security. You know, it threatens me. You know, it threatens my sense of self. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not safe anymore. You know? But if you, could, if you can develop that friendliness, that openness, you realize that most of the time those, those uh, threats are not as bad as you think. Most of it's just our thinking. Could be this, could be that, could be... You know. like, like I remember when I was traveling too, there were situations where, you know, I've, it was a bit, you know, a bit dodgy what the people would, how they would react to me, react to me. And my first, my first, uh, action was just to go right up to them and say, good morning, or hello, you know, where's this, where's that? And they were, most of them were so disarmed, you know, because if, if you're a suspicious person, you usually try and hide away, you see. But I just went up to them. I, I, I approached them. And so they realized, oh, that, that person can't be a threat then. If they're coming towards me, yeah, making a, making a, making a friendly gesture to them rather than threatening or running away or running hide or something. So most of them react in a very positive way because, oh, he's obviously not, he's obviously showing he's harmless, you know, so they don't feel threatened anymore. And then of course the, the way to counter delusion is to investigate, to study, yeah, inquire, find out, to yeah, study the scriptures, to ask questions, to investigate, contemplate. A way to do this with regard to the self, and we have our, you know, our particular uh, uh, states of mind. We have our particular feelings arise, and just try to question it. You know, why are you thinking about that? What what is this feeling really? You know, maybe maybe in the beginning you you notice there's a, a pleasant feeling arises, and just ask yourself, oh, pleasant feeling, is it really pleasant? Look at the body. Look at the mind. And you might notice just behind it, maybe there's a little bit of unpleasantness there. You know, it was just like it was just a bit of a front. You know, we'd we'd like to always be be happy and be comfortable and be pleasant. You know, have pleasant feelings. Yeah, but sometimes it's it's so phony. You, know, you ask somebody, "How are you feeling?" They always, "Oh, fine, fine, fine." Yeah, how are you really feeling? <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to talk about it. <laughs> Like, a, like like going to the going to meeting officials like at airports or something, you know. And how are you today? Do you really want to know? Really? Do you want to tell me this? I want me to tell you my whole story about how I really feel? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> They're just trying to be friendly, right? So you just say fine. <laughs> but if you look in your own moods, you know, you might just notice that the on the surface it seems to be fine, but look look more carefully. Yeah, look, look more closely at it. Is this, you know, what kind of a pleasant feeling is this? There's superficial pleasant feelings, there, there's deeper pleasant feelings, and then there's really, you know, really, really deep-rooted pleasant feelings. A sense of well-being, profound well-being. Body, emotions, states of mind. Many times the, the pleasant feeling, so-called pleasant feeling, is quite superficial. Oh yes, I, and I, I just look at the pleasant side of it. You know, feeling has a very many many dimensions to it, but I just look usually at the pleasant side of it. You see, mm -hmm. like you know, you're you're well rested, so okay, comfortable, rest, rested, yeah. But oh, look closer. Oh, there's a sore knee. Oh, oh, there's a sore back. Oh, <laughs> mm hmm. Yes, you just you know you're seeing you're investigating more carefully now. Your delusion, you know, is is a bit, uh, is a bit uh, 
what do you say, it doesn't, doesn't look very clearly, delusion. is confusion, unclarity, uncertainty, not looking, not knowing definitely. Yeah. That's a kind of, that's a form of delusion too. Yeah. But to look really, really carefully at it, you can see through that. And that's what it means to practice of mindfulness, sati, attentiveness. The Buddha is saying, look at you know, bodily sensations, look at the body, look at the feeling, look at the states of mind. Yeah, we, we just casually look, glance at them and think, okay, it's okay. Yep, I'm, I'm holding together all right, yeah. <laughs> look more carefully. Oh, inside we're trembling. <laughs> but until we see that, we don't make any, won't make any adjustments. Uh, we won't make any changes. We just, we just, our, our life is based upon this fundamental delusion yeah, that we're, we're, we're happy and fine. Yeah. That's probably why for many people hearing the Buddha's teachings about unsatisfactoriness is a bit unsettling. Yeah, because I mean, I think many people, they realize happy or comfortable or, you know, aren't, aren't really feeling well, you know. But they got to play the game, they got to keep on the surface, and if they, if they admit they're not feeling well, you know, it can be quite unstabilizing. It can be quite frightening even. Yeah. Most people don't know a way out of it. Yeah. But we're lucky to be Buddhists. Buddha gave us the, the way out of suffering too. Yeah, the way out of unsatisfactoriness. You know, practicing this Eightfold Path, you know, it is possible to realize cessation of, of unsatisfactoriness of dukkha, but most of us have to work at it. And the first level is to notice it. If we aren't even, aren't even noticing it, we haven't even started on the path yet. But of course, you know, we have the support of the other factors in the Eightfold Path. We have the support of, of right view. We have support of, you know, the precepts. We have the support of some degree of collectedness and calm. Yeah, we have a, a, a reference to a meditation object like the breathing. You know, that can give us some sense of a peace, a peace of mind. Yeah. Even though you know, around us maybe things are a bit unsettled, but back to the breathing, back to our, our point of reference again, yeah, set the attention on the breathing. Yeah, and you can breathe in carefully and calmly. Yeah, the world's falling, about, falling apart around you, but just keep breathing. And, yeah. And it's okay for a while. <laughs> but if we keep it in mind, the, uh, the whole purpose of the Buddhist teachings to realize selflessness. I mean, I mentioned it to somebody, one of, my, one of the monks actually, and he was saying that's a bit too idealistic for people, you know, selflessness, my goodness. You know, it sounds, it sounds so, so uh, abstract and so kind of, you know, idealistic. Selflessness, but I mean, it's just a, it's a direction to go in. Just like looking at the top of the mountain, you know. If you, you know, if you set your set your sight on the top of the mountain, you know, and you're you're reasonable about it, maybe you eventually get there. But if you just think, oh no, I, I can't make it. I'll never make it. Yeah, don't even try. I I, I tell the story about when I was in in Switzerland, and there was this from my window, I could see this rock sticking out up on a mountain there, very high up, nearly 3,000 meters. It was up in the, up close to the glacier. I could see it from my window. Yeah. And I thought, oh, one day I just thought, oh, wouldn't it be interesting, here I am down here looking at that rock every day. Wouldn't it be interesting if I was up at the rock looking down at my, my hut? Huh? That's, that sounds, you know, interesting. Have a different perspective on things. So one of our picnic days, I thought, okay, I'll go, I'll try and go up there. Yeah. So I started up the mountain. It was a long way up, 3,000 meters, you know, it's, and the monastery is at 1,200 meters. So what's that? 1,800 meters climbing up and down again too. Yeah. I couldn't just fly down, you know, <laughs> you could have bored a paraglider, the paragliders around there. I don't know how to do it. And I've seen them crash too. So I, <laughs> it's better to walk down. So I set up there, set, set off walking, and I know, you know, walking the mountains enough that you, you can't be too ambitious because the weather changes and you, you, your energy level changes and you know, many different things. So, 
So I started up there, and I just kept walking up and walking up and walking up, and <clears throat> went past the, the mountain hut, kept walking. Oh, gee, this is easy today, easy walking. It was, and I was so energetic, you know, the, the path up the last part of it, because it was up above the tree line, it was just rocks. It's called scree, just loose rocks and, and gravel, you see. So the path zigzagged up the scree slope, you know. And I was, I was so energetic, I thought, God, it's too slow. So there was a stream coming down beside it, so I had to, I'll go up the stream bed, straight up. You know, I got bounding up these rocks, you know, up over the stream bed, and I got to the top of the ridge, and I'm on the wrong ridge. <laughs> the path went that way. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> it was a long way down the valley up the other side to get to the rock. Okay, maybe not today. <laughs> no. So I just walked around the bottom of the mountain under the cliff and had my lunch there and came down again. Okay, not today. <laughs> so then I don't know, a few weeks later, another day, clear weather maybe. It looked, looked pretty clear, so I again went up there again. I said, I'm not going to follow that creek bed. I'll follow the path this time. Up, zigzag up the scree slope. I got up to the top of the scree slope and the clouds came in. <laughs> it started raining. <laughs> and I know, okay, you know. Just to just to pin this label on my on my rucksack, saying I made that made that up to that rock there, you know, safer, you know, to save my life to go down again. Don't be caught on a mountaintop in a in a thunderstorm. <clears throat> so down again. Okay, that's twice. <laughs> so finally, the third time I was going up there, and I again I didn't have much, you know, just try it out, see how far I get. I mean, it's all. Wherever you go, you get a nice view anyway, and you can always have a walk, and you know, it's, it's, you know, it's pleasant anywhere. It doesn't need to get to that rock necessarily. Just a, just a rough, you know, rough goal to, to aim for. I don't have to get there, really. <clears throat> anyway, the third time I just walked up, you know, took my time. If you go up too fast, of course, you get winded, and you run out of energy halfway up. You gotta take, you gotta pace yourself, you know, I had so many hours to get up and down again before dark. Yeah, so I just walked up and walked up and walked up and, well, I made it. Walking up there and suddenly, oh, there's a rock right there. Oh. Even had some time left over and climbed it up to the glacier. You know? But didn't have, you know, crampons and things to go in the glacier. It was maybe dangerous. So I just, I just looked at it and tasted some ice or something. And <laughs> Came down again, but <laughs> had plenty of time then. So three times it took me to get up there, but and actually the view wasn't that great anyway. <laughs> it, was a, it was a good idea at the time, but so what? There's my window, my hut way down there. I could hardly see the window, you know, so far down below. And <laughs> the stone was bigger than my window, much bigger. So, <laughs> but now I can say I made it up there. I've been up there and seen my window. <laughs> well, vaguely, <laughs> I need to know where the monastery was anyway, but <clears throat> but just having that as a general goal, you know, and uh, you know, on the in the in the on the path, whether you make it or not, isn't so important, you know. But it's a matter of traveling on the path, and that's what we we learned about the nature of the self. Yeah, We're, whichever, however far we go on the path, we still learn about the nature of self. And the more you learn about yourself, the more ideally you can let it go. Yeah. So if, you know, it doesn't matter if you know if you go part way, then you know you've learned about the self. You learn to see through it. The self is not going to fool you anymore into believing it as an absolute thing. You learned a few more tricks. The self has has played on you. You know. And whatever level of practice we you know arrive at, you know, at the end of our life, yeah, we don't, we don't lose it. Yeah, we, we, and it's still you know, on the way, you know, whatever level we attain to, you know, it, still, it still will be less suffering. Uh, the whole nature of suffering is based on the self. The less self we have, the less suffering we have, basically, simple. The more that we can let go of the sense of self, or grasping it, holding on to it, the lighter we'll be. Yeah. That's why you know, people talk about, you know, they... Uh, they think spiritual practice will go to heaven or somewhere. See? 
But the point is that, you know, to me, so-called so heaven realms are defined by the, the different levels of attachment to self. You know, the, the so-called heaven realms, you know. The lighter, the less self you have, the pull you down to the human realm, to the, you know, the, the core self, really core self, gets dragged down to the, let's say, the, the animal realm. Still has very, very coarse uh, expressions of self. Back to the animal, animal realm, or even, even lower. Where yeah. people have very, very strong greed, aversion, delusion. You know, very strong expressions of self. They say even go to the so-called hell realms, you see. But the less self you have, it's like the lighter you are. So you float up to the higher, higher realms, the more, more refined realms of existence called the heaven realms. Until, you know, the ultimate is Nibbana. Uh, Nibbana is completely selfless. You know, it's uh, the people, the Arahants in Nibbana, they have realized completely, you know, non-grasping of self. They realize it completely, 24-7. Those on, you know, Sotapanas, whatever, less stream entries, they've realized a little bit of selflessness, a little, some degree of it. So the lighter, you know, the lighter our grasping of self, the higher our state of consciousness, if you like. It's not a matter of, you know, me traveling up there, you know. In the, in the heaven realms, you don't bring yourself with you. <laughs> you don't go to heaven. <laughs> the, you know, your, your selflessness goes to heaven. <laughs> the degree to which you can let go of the self. <clears throat> So we understand that. I hopefully you keep that in mind. Then you know a practice. Then you can say has a you know has a, a, a element of wisdom to it, not just a matter of following rites and rituals and rules and things, and, but we know the purpose of it. Ah, right. You know, using the the precepts to learn learn to relinquish a grasping of self, self and all of its supports, its comforts, its habits. And of course, it's, you know, it's not, it's more, it's easier said than done. But having that as our principle, we, we know what the purpose of the practice is. So yeah, that is wisdom. And now I know what, what's this, what this is all about. Yeah. And, you know, selflessness in a way, you know, as you can say, is our, is our, you know, natural heritage in a way. Yeah. Yeah. If we really are aspiring to the absolute truth, Nature, nature is selfless. We impose our views on nature. We, we, we impose our perceptions on it and our views on it. And it should be like this. It should be like that. You know, it, it shouldn't be this hot. It shouldn't be this cold. But nature is the way it is. Sorry. Yeah. You're the one who's in the way. <laughs> Yourself is in the way. Yeah. <clears throat> nature is the way it is. So we understand that, hopefully, you know, when our practice develops, we, we practice with really with right view then, and the right view then becomes more and more real to us, more and more, more and more wisdom then. <clears throat> it's not just having an acknowledgement of cause and effect, but actually putting it into practice and seeing it for ourselves. The more that we can practice renunciation and harmlessness, you know, the right the samasankapa, the right aspiration, whether you can practice that, it requires more selflessness, more renunciation, more harmlessness, and all kinds of things that could technically harm us. There are even stories in the, in the scriptures of some of the enlightened beings you know, who were threatened by robbers, and they, they weren't afraid. It doesn't matter if I die, you know, I've, I've finished my work. I'm not afraid of death anymore. You know, it's easy to say, I don't know if I could do it or not, but... <laughs> Still get frightened by snakes, <laughs> so I guess I, I guess it's not that deeply ingrained in me. <laughs> they let go of dying, but <laughs> still recoil with too much chili. So, <laughs> so uh, I haven't, still haven't renounced that one yet. <laughs> my 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 version to chili, but <laughs> that'll be one of the last the last uh, defilements to go. I think. <laughs> The one day I never know, one day I might, you know, have some hot food and say, oh, didn't even notice it. <laughs> no, maybe. <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs> but once we have the right perspective, I mean, it's just like 
to me, it's like we, we have this understanding of the Eightfold Path. That first of all, it's just, you know, it's logical, just kind of intellectual knowledge. But as we begin to practice it, it's like coming into focus. Oh, that's what that means. That's what that really means. What, what right energy really means, right effort. Uh, right, uh, right, samasati. Uh, mindfulness at first, okay, right, I have an idea about it, I have a thought about it, it's a logical definition, but you begin to practice it, oh, now I begin to get a direct experience of it. Uh, right, samadhi, samasamadhi, samasati. It becomes clearer and clearer and clearer till you really realize, oh, now I really understand what the path is. The path of practice really is now a direct experience, yeah, not just an intellectual knowledge then. And then we gain more confidence. Well, the more that we practice this, the more it's going to give us the experience of beyond suffering, selflessness beyond suffering. So, I mean, this is something we have to know for ourselves. You know, nobody can, can we, we haven't got a, a suffering monitor we can plug you into. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can see people, you know, whether they're suffering or not, but, <laughs> but it's hard to tell anyway, isn't it? It's hard to tell too. Maybe you can test, just test blood pressure. You've got high blood pressure, you're suffering more. Or something, <laughs> EEG monitor or something. <laughs> have to have an Ibana monitor. <laughs> How close are you to Ibana? We haven't got one yet, so have to know for yourself. Know for yourself. So when we are aware of, increasingly aware of the effect of practicing the Eightfold Path, yeah, and noticing, you know, less and less sense of self. Less and less often we think of ourself all the time. You know. And realize, oh, it's beginning to take effect. I mean, for, for many people, you know, I would say, you know, a kind of a worldly attitude is the self is in their mind all the time, constantly constant thinking about the self. Yeah. And the more one has practiced spiritual practice, one realizes the limitations of that and let it go. Yeah. Less thoughts of oneself, less worries about oneself. Yeah. And one feels more peace and more, more. Uh, lightly with that, more sense of well-being, free from the torments of self. So this is something which the Buddha has given us as a, a gift, great blessing and a gift, so it's up to us to make use of it. And it's uh, freely available, it's just up to us to put in the effort and find out uh, this way of practice and realize the results for ourselves. then. So uh, all the best in your practice. Uh-huh.